All right. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started right here at the top of the hour. It is good to see so many people from so many different places out there. Um, as more people come in, hopefully they will find themselves over there and say uh, hello to, to us as they um, join us in the webinar. So today is kind of a huge topic. Emergency preparedness is, is really difficult to condense down into just one hour, hour and a half long session. So needless to say, um, I'm just going to be sort of starting a lot of topics here and touching briefly on them. I've taught multiple day long workshops on this material. So this is not going to be completely comprehensive. It's meant to be sort of more of a primer to kind of give you some places to start when you are emergency planning for yourself. Um, but before we get into today's topic, I did want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Samantha Forsco. I am the Preservation Specialist here at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. And uh, for those of you who know me, um, emergency planning is definitely one of my favorite topics out there. Um, I am not a Philadelphia native. I actually grew up in Alaska. And I think when you're born in Alaska, you just sort of are always in that kind of emergency mindset. You never know when you are going to be snowed in. So um, I always was sort of interested in that topic. And when I moved down to the lower 48, as we call it from up there, I was kind of shocked that not everybody um, did this a little bit more. So I've been able to find kind of this great marriage between my interest in cultural heritage institutions and emergency planning. Um, I studied in grad school and everything. So um, this is definitely a topic that's near and dear to my heart and I'm excited to be sharing it today with you. I also wanted to let you know a little bit about the program that we are doing today, which is the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program, um, RHSP for, sure, for short. Um, and this program, this webinar has been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH, and I'm sure most of you know that was founded in 1965 as an independent federal agency and it funds education research and public programs in the humanities. And it awards grants in many categories, including challenge grants, preservation education and training grants, and digital projects for public grants. At the end of 2016, uh, the organization that I work for um, was awarded nearly $400,000 to support its preservation field services program in 2017 and 2018. And the bulk of that program is a regional collection stewardship program. And I've been calling it, as I said, as a whole, Regional Heritage Stewardship Program, RHSP. Not a great acronym, but it'll work. Um, in the past, we CCHA, where I work, has led very successful collection stewardship programs in, in the Philadelphia area where we are from. Um, so we wanted to kind of build on that and set out to see if we could take that kind of on the road to areas of the country who have traditionally been kind of a little underserved in this area, not having a lot of access to preservation res uh, resources. So in 2017 and 2018, the sort of first iteration of this program, we piloted the model in the Deep South, including Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida, and in Appalachia, including Kentucky, West Virginia, and parts of Ohio and Pennsylvania. So we are now in the new version of that. This program was renewed in 2019, and we're expanding into the Intermountain West area, which includes the state of Nevada and Utah, and parts of Idaho, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. So I know there's a lot of people in here who are not from those areas. So that's totally fine. Um, this one in particular, there's going to be a lot of, of topics that are you're able to kind of extrapolate to your own areas. But just to let you know, it, we are kind of taking an Intermountain West um, approach to a lot of the webinars that you'll be seeing from us. And we actually are really lucky because we have, for this iteration, some great partners on the ground um, in Utah in particular, who are kind of co-hosting this whole program with us. So I did wanna give a quick shout out to the Utah Division of Arts and Museums and Utah Humanities. Um, they are really great resources for you guys there in the Utah area to follow up with on a lot of the things that we are learning about. And the real quick on the organization that I work for, um, we're all the way in here in Philadelphia, which is why it's great that we have that on the ground partner. Um, the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, CCAHA, which is where I work in Philadelphia is a nonprofit conservation facility specializing in the treatment of works on paper, photographs and books through conservation and state-of-the-art digital imaging services. 
And aside from that conservation work that we do, we've expanded to offer a variety of other services such as fellowship opportunities, fundraising support, and most relevant here, disaster assistance. Um, the department that I work for, which is the Preservation Services Office, is the outreach and education arm of the organization, and I present programs, um, you know, teach, teach workshops all around the country, conduct on-site assessments, and assist institutions with a lot of planning, including, most importantly today, emergency planning. So, have a lot of experience in this realm in particular. So, let's go ahead, um, talk a little bit about what's coming in the future. Uh, this is what else to expect out of the RHSP program. We'll be doing a lot more webinars. So as I said, you guys who are not from the region, that's okay. You can jump on to these webinars, but they will be sort of geared towards that region. Um, we also will be doing in-person workshops. Um, next month, we will be in, uh, we will be over in Utah and Colorado. So I'll, I'll have some more save the dates on that um, in a minute. And then when we aren't there, of course, we will try to still be connecting people with preservation resources. Um, here are the webinars that are kind of coming down the pike here. You can mark your calendars for them. Um, I believe they are all live on the website right now. So if one of these is particularly interesting to you, please go sign up. And um, if you have topics you're interested in seeing in 2020, please let us know as well. We're still programming for 2020. And then I did really want to point this out as well. We have some upcoming workshops as well. There's six workshops throughout the whole program, but you can jump in and out and take anyone you want. Um, the next set of workshops are workshops three and four, and they will be repeated once in each of those areas, Cortez, Colorado, and St. George, Utah. Um, the workshop, the first workshop, workshop three, will be about kind of essential policies and procedures, really focusing on a collections management policy. and the next workshop will be on risk assessment. And that's, uh, you know, kind of, a, if you like this webinar, you're going to love that in-person workshop. We're going to get to conduct uh, a risk assessment for our host site, and it should be really fun. So um, if you are interested in that, everything is live on the website, so please go sign up. All right, let's get on to today's topic. We've got lots to cover in little time, of course. Um, so I want to begin by kind of congratulating you all for taking this possibly first step in emergency planning and attending this webinar. However, I, you know, want to let you know kind of right off the bat, emergency planning is never really over and done with. That's the fun of it. Um, you are going to be able to leave today with some ideas on how to get started emergency planning in your institution. However, this is really just one stage of the emergency management cycle. Um, I would say it's sort of the preparedness stage there. Every disaster, even small or minor incidents, can inform how you um, can, you know, more appropriately mitigate, which will affect your preparedness, which will affect your response, et cetera. And it's kind of never ending in this cycle. So welcome to the never ending cycle of emergency management. And we do tend to use the words emergency and disaster sort of interchangeably. I do it a lot too. So um, they're not really the same though. Um, an emergency is an unanticipated event that requires immediate action. If emergencies aren't handled effectively and quickly, they can turn into a disaster. So therefore, if I'm thinking about it and, and you know, really I'm being strict about it, I prefer to use the phrase emergency plan as it implies you still have some kind of control. Disaster is sort of a loaded word. It implies something kind of really major and catastrophic, like a giant earthquake, a big snowstorm that knocks out everything. Um, I think, especially in the kind of cultural heritage community, libraries, archives, museums, et cetera, um, we sort of have these little emergencies that have the propensity to turn into being disasters um, because we're not ready, but they don't have to. Right? Emergency and disaster tend to get used interchangeably in our field because of this, but in fact, many of the things that we are dealing with are emergencies, and we want them to stay emergencies. We don't want them to get out of control and become disasters. Um, institutions really tend to plan well for those big disasters, you know, giant hurricanes and things like that, um, but not as well for the, the smaller emergencies. Um, like that HVAC leak or that, you know, tiny roof, roof leak that just sort of gets out of control. We prepare for emergencies and if our planning is successful, we can prevent most disasters. Um, an emergency, no matter how small, is a training opportunity. It's a, it's a chance to test the plan, 
debrief on an event and train staff. And it's also an opportunity to learn how to be prepared. Um, emergency preparedness is not simply having a plan or manual, but rather it's a combination of written documents, training, raising awareness, conducting drills, rewriting or clarifying based on those drills and ongoing training. You conduct this preparation process within your institution, your parent institutions, and in some instances within your community. So emergency preparedness is important for people at home and at work, and it's related to our personal lives, our own family planning, um, et cetera. So it's a really sort of all, all the time kind of, um, kind of topic. And all of the planning, and I'm going to kind of go today, uh, moving forward, assuming that the emergency personal safety has been taken care of first, and it is the top priority. People first, then collections. It really has to be kind of the mantra with uh, emergency planning. And I know the longer you kind of work with collection, collections and work in cultural heritage institutions, it sort of becomes your stuff, right? You, you don't want to do anything until... Um, you can make sure that that's going to be safe, but it's really important that you yourself are protected first and foremost. Um, at the University of Hawaii, I have a great story about a flood that happened there. Not a great story, but a story that illustrates this uh, point. They, they had a flood that happened there, it kind of um, went into the lower level of a building, covered um, a bottom step that was supposed to be there. It, the floodwaters were actually so strong it broke off the step. So there was a staff person who was you know, really attached to the collections and eager to get in there and start rescuing things. And so he went charging down the stairs. Uh, he knew that last step was there because he works there. Of course, it wasn't there anymore. So he misstepped and ended up breaking his ankle. So after that, he had to be first evacuated out of the situation. So it slowed down the whole rescue. Um, and then he didn't even get to participate in the salvage anyway. So it would have been better for everyone just to wait and make sure that all human health and safety measures have been taken care of before charging in. So that's really kind of the basic premise which guides all emergency response actions, health and safety first. I know we love our collections, but we have to remember this. Um, and that's even hard, you know, for us too. Over here at CCHA, we were testing out our emergency plan a few years back and the director was giving us kind of a series of scenarios to, to respond. And, and the first, supposedly the easiest one was, you see smoke in the building, what do you do? Of course, all the conservators started talking about how they were going to get the collections into the vault and secure them, but that's not the answer. Do you guys know the answer? You can write it in the chat box if you do, but of course the answer is get out of the building, right? Evacuation is first action. When in doubt, get out, right? Um, where, to, where to go? Establish a meeting place in advance and make sure everyone knows about it. The place should be about 500 feet from the building and also take into account who is doing what during this evacuation, like who is assisting those with special needs, for example, and also what kind of system for tracking people are you using. Is everyone accounted for who has been evacuated? Know who you're missing if that's possible. Um, as far as staff, you can often control that. Um, staying on top of when and uh, when the building can be re-entered and making note of what was done and, and where people went. Some general questions to consider when preparing for evacuation include, has everyone known or believed to be inside been accounted for? Have all injuries been attended to? Is the building structurally sound or safe to enter? You'll probably need an okay for that one from the first responders. You never want to enter a building that's been evacuated until it has been cleared to do so. And this is especially critical in fire situations as you're not only unsure of kind of what's unstable, but also what kind of chemicals might have been exposed like asbestos. Um, it's also important that even after that initial evacuation, that workers are protected during the recovery and salvage phases. This slide shows very minimal protection, gloves, masks, goggles, light sources, walkie talkies. Um, but it's, it's, that's a very important thing to start off with. Um, kind of a really important thing that I wanna point out is that there's two of these people, right? You never wanna enter a damaged building alone always send in groups of at least two and, and use the buddy system to let others know what you're doing. Always consider the building and collection guilty until proven innocent. We're not the criminal justice system here. Um, assume everything is broken, that electricity is ready to electrocute you, there's a gas leak and it's ready to explode. Just assume the worst, take all precautions. 
I know you're thinking, this was supposed to be about collections. Why are we spending all this time talking about human safety? So I just wanted to kind of take this minute here in the front to kind of reiterate how important human safety is when we're starting to plan for disasters. So I promise I'll move on to collections and get off my soapbox, but I wanted to make sure to drive that point home. So there's basically two different types of disasters, man-made and natural, and both or either can happen to you. Um, I know a lot of people think we're, we're safe here, but there are definitely things that can still happen. Natural disasters do tend to depend a little bit more on your region and location, but you know, fire can be both natural, as in you know, lightning or wildfire, but it can also be human caused, like electrical fire or vandalism, arson. Um, so those are things you know, that might fall into to both categories. Um, there's a lot of other sort of natural disasters that you might be particu particularly susceptible to. In our Intermountain West region, I know that we are really susceptible to the fires that I just mentioned. Um, and that can also kind of have a triggering um, effect in things like mudslides that can result from kind of heavy rain and the, the ground has been sort of um, unstabilized due to those wildfires. So sometimes those things kind of go in handy. Um, I know, of course, there's the possibility of snowstorms and, and sort of all of the winter weather effects that happen in that win in our Intermountain West region. Um, and I suppose there's a little bit of a risk of some earthquakes uh, to come by as well. If you have a particular natural disaster in your area, please let us know in that chat box over there. Um, of course, there are man-made disasters which are a little bit more universal. Um, that can be, everybody's kind of susceptible to those. Man-made disasters um, are often the result of bringing in new threats like construction around a building. Landscaping topo topography changes can bring in new flows of water. Um, you know, it might be chemicals on site that, that weren't there before. There might be various electrical equipment um, being used in those construction projects. But then there's also other issues for man-made disasters as well that are as simple as um, you know, roof leaks and things of that maintenance issues. Um, no matter how low your risk might be to natural disasters, we all run kind of a very high risk from human caused disasters. Vandalism can result in fire, water, really a lot of those other things on that, that list there. Um, so always good to kind of think from all angles about what those um, risks might be. And the most common culprit in most all of these is water damage. Almost all emergencies end up as water emergencies in the end. Natural disasters sort of tend to end up with water, plumbing problems, leaky roofs, fire hoses if there's a fire, sprinkler discharge if there's a fire. Um, so even things that you might not think originally, that um, can often turn out to be a water disaster in the end. So that's, I tend to kind of focus along there. Um, and I like to do that because when we are emergency planning, it's really good to focus on the emergency type situations where a quick response will keep the emergency from becoming a disaster. So that's, um, it's good to kind of think from that, what can we actually do? Because some things will be out of your control. So you might want to focus on what is achievable first. So please take a minute here, think about what your institution might be most susceptible for. Let us know in the comment box. I see over there, we've got hurricanes, of course, in Florida, which is definitely a big one. Um, but maybe you guys are located you know, near um, near a campus or something and have a bunch of rowdy college kids, that might also be uh, something you are susceptible to. And while we are thinking that, it kind of leads us right in uh, to risk assessment, right? Thinking about what those things you might be vulnerable to. And even just what we're doing right now, writing them in the comments, that is a first st start to a risk assessment. Leaky roofs and old buildings, yes. Uh, flood cycles in DC, snowstorms, those are all great, great, um, not great issues, but good that you've identified them. Um, so risk assessment is, is, is that, right? It's an important preliminary step to emergency planning. It's where I kind of recommend everybody starts in this process. And a risk assessment is a systematic process in which you examine issues from those hurricanes to that leaky roof, um, and then you determine a game plan. I know you're all here today, probably because you're most specifically interested in cultural institutions and collections, but really you can do this kind of risk assessment um, 
methodology to a lot of other types of organizations um, and kind of apply it to a lot of other kind of programs as well. The ideal outcome of a risk assessment is to come up with methods to mitigate or make less severe the risks that you identify. And honestly, a lot of that is kind of common sense. Um, I have, I love this photo. I, I use, it, use it a lot for stuff um, to kind of think uh, about what are some risks. If you can see some risks, they don't have to be a huge disaster, but what are just some, some little risks that you might see? You can write some of those in the comments. I'll tell you what I see. Um, you know, there's objects sitting directly on the floor, tripping hazards, exactly. Um, there's looks like some two artifacts in the back that are sitting directly on the floor next to that fire extinguisher without any boxes or anything. Um, they could get knocked into. There's lots of issues there. Um, so you might see, you might see more. Um, so let us know. And then we also want to think when we're ident vents, that's another good one. Um, so we've identified some of the risks and then we also want to, at the same time identifying risks, we want to also identify our mitigation methods. So, you know, those objects sitting directly on the floor, the mitigation method, pick them up off the floor, right? Not rocket scientists here. Um, it's probably a little bit of an oversimplification. We don't know the whole situation, like what kind of space is available? Where would we put them if we pick them up off the floor? Um, but that's the general idea. As I said, the the ideal outcome of the uh, risk assessment is to figure out a mitigation method, but sort of the, the trick is we want it to be a reasonable, which in a lot of cases is affordable, right? Mitigation methods. So there's some great risks you guys are, are seeing in there. That's the easy part, right? <laughs> um, so when you are doing a risk assessment, who should you involve in that process? Um, really kind of the more the merrier to a certain extent it's important to have input from all sides of your organization and all employees the collection staff may have a very different view about what the biggest risks are to your organization than say the education staff for example but all concerns are valid and need to be analyzed and either mitigated for or planned for um, facilities and security staff are always really important to involve in this process um, as again, they offer a really unique perspective that might be different from say the curators. So it's uh, also really great to get their input. Um, another group that I always uh, recommend getting involved with is the first responders at some point. They can provide a different point of view on the situation and get you thinking about issues you hadn't really considered before. They'll also let you know exactly what they're going to do if there is a disaster on your site. And this is important because how they respond to a disaster could be a huge response or have a huge impact on your recovery. So I was saying before, sometimes you can't control, you know, a fire happens. So all you can control is the response of that. And, and having that direct line of communication with the fire department is going to be really important. Um, if the fire de department, for example, is responding to a fire, are they going to spray everything with water or do they use some kind of, you know, chemical? Water is probably easier to deal with than the chemical, so you'll need to let them know um, that you are going to mitigate that chemical risk um, by having them only spray with water. Uh, I had a site tell me once that they were on a they were doing a tour with their local fire department, which is definitely something I recommend everybody to do. Um, but the fire chief started telling them, um, I should note, this was a historic house, uh, that if there was a fire in here, they'd probably break down this wall and that wall and the site, you know, kind of panicked and was like, wait, wait, if you're going to start breaking down walls of our historic house, you might as well let it let a whole thing go because we can't be a historic house museum without the historic house bit. Um, so instead, the fire department installed a Knox box on the outside of the house. Um, it has keys to the historic home inside of it. So in the event of the fire, the fire department could get in without breaking any walls down. So that might not be how the fire department works in your area, but they might have some other mitigation methods to work out and you won't know if you don't ask. So one suggestion I always make is having those walkthroughs with those, the fire department, the police department, hearing what kind of solutions they might have. And I have an outside assessor listed there as well. Um, sometimes it can be really helpful to get an outside opinion on, on what's going on with your risks. This is an organization like mine, CCAHA. We do a lot of these assessments, but there's other organizations out there who do similar and independent consultants who do um, similar things. Really familiar with collections and can kind of help spot risks that you might pass over. Kind of like how those first responders spot risks that 
that you might not notice. Um, an outside assessor can kind of do that as well. So they are helpful in, in including in a risk assessment project. So there's a number of ways to kind of begin thinking about risks, um, but I often find it's helpful to divide um, potential risks into categories. And, and broadly, I think of them in these kind of two main categories, risks fall into location and facilities. And then of course, there's kind of subcategories within each of those as well. And you don't have to do it this way. It's just a way I find that that is helpful. Um, risks associated with location might include the obvious, like a lot of the weather stuff we've been talking about, but it could also be something, um, you know, a little bit less obvious. I, I said that the rowdy college kids earlier, maybe you're next to a college campus and, and you have a bigger vandalism risk because of that. Um, that might be something that, that you would want to consider based on your location. Um, Risks based on facilities are often more like maintenance issues, you know, leaky roofs, faulty electric wiring, things of, of that nature. So like I said, you don't have to do it that way, but it's one way you're trying to kind of wrap your brain around this um, that makes it a little bit easier. In either case, it's really important to be kind of tracking past emergencies or disasters, no matter the size, to help you really figure out your areas of need. Risk assessments often aim to be very objective and data-driven, and this can be another area to collect data and numbers. So you'll want to keep, something I suggest is an emergency event history log, and record all the relevant data so you can kind of see where recurring problems and trends um, that seem to be happening. Really be able to kind of focus your time and energy in the most appropriate areas. At the museum I, I worked at um, in the past, we had a risk management task force team that would meet once a month to discuss all incidents that happened on the campus. The incidents would range from things like a burst pipe in a bathroom that leaked into a storeroom um, to you know, how many times the security guards had to tell patrons to stay off the outdoor sculpture. So we divided them kind of into areas, security, collections, facilities, that sort of thing. So we could kind of keep a, a tally of where our kind of problem areas were. Um, we were actually able to use that data um, to advocate for more security guards in that outdoor sculpture park. So we were able to, to note how many times they had to tell them to get off of the outdoor sculptures. And we were able to use that data to mitigate by having more um, security members there. Um, so that can be really helpful. Uh, if you also have kind of the dates, duration, et cetera, of things like, you know, how many times that bathroom pipe leaked in the past year, you'll have a stronger argument as to why, um, you know, you should replace that pipe or do a big maintenance project. You need to redirect funds to that area. It's impossible to do if you don't have the data. So it can be really helpful. So there's a number of tools out there that can help you to kind of evaluate risks that you've already identified. I really love that first link that I gave you there, the um, FAIC's Risk Evaluation and Planning Program. They provide you with kind of a matrix to help you, um, you know, think of risks and then prioritize and rank them. And um, they are actually, this is actually the model that we're going to be using during our workshop in October. So it might be really good for you to take a look at it if you're going to be attending that workshop. Um, we'll get a chance to practice doing it. Um, you'll be the, the rock star achiever of, of the workshop if you already have familiarity. Um, but there's a number of other tools that are helpful as well. I just listed two other ones to consider. Um, the UC Library Risk Management Tool has a number of different templates and calculators you can use to evaluate risks. And again, not just your collections and preservation risks, it also helps you to think about risk assessment in terms of things like programs and budgets. Um, similarly, the Nonprofit Risk Management Center has a tool that kind of walks you through how to conduct risk, risk assessments in a very easy way and again is applicable to a lot of different areas, not just limited to preservation. So we will be going deeper into this topic of risk assessment during that October workshop again. So if this was something that was interesting to you, please mark your calendars and we'll see you in Utah or Colorado. Um, so moving on, you've, you've identified your risks, you've rake, rated them and ranked them, and now what? Ideally, as I mentioned before, you'll figure out what you can eliminate or reduce as much as possible. That might mean that you are going to build archival enclosures for all of your artifacts, or you're going to make sure everything is off the floor. Um, but what do you do for the risks that you can't uh, eliminate or reduce? 
you prepare, right? You might not have funds to repair that leaky roof, but you can prepare by keeping leak supplies handy. Um, you might not be able to predict when or if somebody is going to have an arson attack at your institution, but you can make sure you have a fire suppression system that's working, or you have a good uh, smoke detection system that alerts the, the first responders right away. Um, and most importantly, you should have a plan how to address the situations should they arise. You might not be able to control an incident or an emergency um, when it happens, but you do get to be prepared and control the response to it. And the way you do that, of course, is by having an emergency plan. So let's talk about that disaster plan. It's going to be a lot easier to kind of take a phased approach. Tackle it in sections. Uh, for example, one, you know, making it in sort of bite-sized chunks. One bite-sized chunk is updating the phone list. Then you move on to your next, next task, right? Um, I always like to kind of set those benchmark goals, doing little chunks of what I think is reasonable and, and putting a little timeline together for myself. Um, that can be really help you to, helpful to you to be kind of empowering rather than discouraging. You can kind of track your progress and, and see what's happening. Um, a timeline is important, but you do want to make sure you're giving yourself plenty of time to do things. I always like to overestimate rather than underestimate. Um, for example, something like negotiating collections priorities, that can take a long time. You have to uh, you know, talk to the curators who have different opinions than the collections managers, who have different opinions than the registrars, than the director, right? So you want to make sure you're giving yourself ample time, even years sometimes for some tasks. Um, when you write the plan, you want to make sure it is clear and reliable. A detailed plan does not mean a long plan. I have gone into sites and seen, you know, 200 plus page long plans that are very detailed. Um, and that's not necessarily bad, but you do want to make sure that you have something quick to look at as well. Um, be concise, but be thorough. We want to make sure we're reviewing the plan at least annually especially that contacts and phone number section. Um, that one tends to, to change a lot, so making sure that we're doing that. Um, I like to set kind of dates to do that. A good, way, a good date, one I keep in mind is May Day, which is May 1st. Um, it is usually used to honor workers in spring, but it's a good reminder to update your plan. It's also kind of right before hurricane season starts for you Florida folks, um, so it, it can be a good one to remember. So I'll talk about this a little more detail later, but working together with colleagues on this endeavor is really important. It's really great to not be in a vacuum. So we'll want to kind of see who else in your area might be interested in this as well. If you are part of the RHSP program, we'll hopefully get you hooked up with other people and, and through these webinars and through those online or through the in-person workshops to kind of see who might be out there um, and you might be able to kind of work with um, in this in the future. So there's a lot of different kind of formats for a disaster plan and ultimately you want to kind of pick the one that's going to work for you. You do need in the end a written formal emergency plan. It can't just be something that lives in your brain, right, um, for your institution. And as I said, there's a lot of different formats that can take. I've seen it. People do it kind of entirely online and like a Google Drive thing that everyone has on their phone. Um, if that works, if that's how you guys operate, then that works. But keep in mind, it might be a disaster where you don't have access to your phone. So you're going to need a printed copy somewhere. Um, my advice to you, no matter what you do, is, is kind of keep it manageable. Don't uh, scatter names and phone numbers throughout um, the document. You'll have to update them a lot if you're doing that. So um, it's kind of easier if you can keep it streamlined and have a contact section in one area. Um, you don't want to get too big or start including kind of extra materials like standard handling guidelines or your collections management policy. Those should be somewhere else, but, you know, you don't need to include those in your disaster plan. If there are, you know, specific sections that have been well written elsewhere, for example, there's probably salvage guides that, that are good already out there written. You don't need to rewrite those for your plan. You can just use the already written ones. Unless you have something really kind of unique about your situation, you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, rewrite all those salvage sections. So the simplest form that I see most people doing and, you know, it works is, is that three ring binder. I think it is, is a nice way to, to go about things. Um, but you can also do, you know, be creative. It's, it's your plan. So, so do what works for you. Something else that I like for sort of a, a quick 
a quick version is kind of a flip chart that can be really helpful as a quick reference tool. It's easily visible, something you can use when your, your brain is not functioning fully and you're in disaster mode. Um, it is sort of difficult to reproduce um, and update, so you'll need a special template for printing. So maybe something to just have as kind of a supplement to your full emergency plan. Um, but yeah, if you have another kind of type of plan that you've used a format, please let us know over in the, the comments uh, box. Um, but my, my biggest advice here is there is no kind of best practice on it. It's what works for your institution and that might be different everywhere. Um, I, I'm gonna walk us through a little bit of a disaster plan um, so you can kind of take some of the ideas that we have here. This is kind of a sample table of contents from a disaster plan that I helped an institution write. Um, you can use this for sort of any size institution. It'll, it'll still work. Um, the particular one that I'm going over is for an art museum, but you can do it for a lot of different types of institution. So the meat of the plan is basically broken into three main categories. Those, those three in the middle, the emergency response um, section, the salvage section, and the restoration section. So I'm gonna kind of go through each of those in a little more detail um, using this. The sort of introduction area is a little self-explanatory, um, what your institution is, all of that. Um, so I will skip that for now. But in the emergency response and stabilization portion, is essentially kind of the immediate needs. You'll need things like um, staff contact and chain of command so you know who to call and how and who's gonna be in charge. Um, you'll want to figure out where you're going to be located, where your kind of command center is going to be um, and have, of course, a couple of different um, ways to, to do that, a couple of different areas in which you might do that. Assigned positions for staff um, so everyone knows what they're doing. Um, the crisis communication center. This is especially good with the media, so you know what people are going to say, right, when they are um, reaching out to the media or even communicating within the institution. You wanna make sure that you're not causing more panic within the institution. Um, that middle section where it says emergency situations and responses, this part does need to be a little bit more tailored to your institution. It will be based on your risk assessment, right? The things that are included under the facilities portion might be really, um, might be something that you, you know, if you don't have a leaky roof, you don't have to include a section on what happens for roof, roof leaks, right? Um, environmental section, if you don't have earthquakes, you don't need to do the earthquake section. Um, so that one will take some customization. And then lastly, there is incident stabilization, which gets a little bit into kind of the, um, how to protect materials there. I did want to point out the comment from Ramona over there. Um, Romana, excuse me, the D plan has, um, is, is a great resource as well. I will get to that one in a minute um, as, a, as a resource, but yes, they are actually updating it soon. So there will be a new version of it launched. Um, I think it's by the end of this year. Um, so the next section I, I mentioned was the salvage area. Um, so this has a couple of different things, that, that sort of damage assessment portion. Um, which there's many guidelines out. There's lots of forms and things that you might be able to take to and use on how to sort of, um, you know, assess the damage that's going on at your institution. Um, you do want to include salvage priorities. Um, I know that this is kind of hard for a lot of institutions. How do you pick your favorite artifacts? How do you pick the most important things? But it's definitely something that you want to do ahead of time so you're not having to make those important decisions on the fly. Um, and you do want to have that in the plan so that you, you know where to look. Um, documentation is another important uh, section in salvage. You'll want to make sure that you are checking, making sure that you're accounting for everything in the disaster, how you're, um, where things are going, um, what things, what's happening to various um, artifacts. Uh, supplies, of course, are important. What supplies you have and where. Vendors and services, so you know who to call for specialized tasks and kind of salvage related how to's there at the bottom. So it's a hard topic to teach in webinar form. Nothing really replaces kind of a hand on experience with salvage materials. So if you ever have one of those, um, but this is where I was talking about those kind of salvage procedures. If your book is wet, you pull it out of the water and this is what you do with it kind of thing is what you, how you would write the directions there. This section, the next section is on um, kind of restoration. That might be sort of the, the longer term 
longer recovery area. Um, and this will all very much depend on the actual incident. If it's, you know, something smaller that you'll be able to kind of uh, recover from within a few weeks, like an HVAC leak, um, this section might be very different than if uh, you are having a major hurricane or major earthquake or something. Um, but you do always want to, after a disaster, have an evaluation of what happened. Um, you'll want to make the event history log as we talked about before so that you're tracking it and go back into your cycle and you also want to have that final report so that you the big lessons learned so you can make sure that you are going about this in the next way sort of really systematically so those are very important things that need to be included in the emergency plan so that you can go back and reevaluate um, lastly, I, I do want to go over some sort of appendices that might be helpful as well. I like to stick these things kind of at the end of the emergency plan, maps, lists, forms, and lists, because those are things that often need updating or can be really handy to kind of pull out and take with you in the disaster. So if you have that three-ring three binder situation, you might have some maps that are laminated, punched hole punches in there, and you can just take them right out run around with them as you might need to in a disaster. Um, and then again, there's the stuff that changes a lot. So if they're in the back of the binder, you don't have to go kind of flipping through the whole the whole plan and updating every single area where, you know, you have the, the name of somebody. If you just have a contact list name and you refer to that appendice in your plan, then it can, can be a little bit easier to do the updating on it. So just to, to brainstorm real quick, some maps that you might want to include are, you know, evacuation plans and meeting points. Um, you definitely want to have those. Uh, you want, you know, your fire extinguishers, your first aid kits, where all of that is. You might also consider having something like a salvage priorities map where your most important collections are located. Of course, that is pretty confidential information, so, so think about uh, that sort of security aspect as well, but it can be helpful in a lot of cases as well. And this is just a sample to kind of get you thinking, you might have some other maps that might be particularly helpful. Some forms that you might want to have. This is, you know, you might want to be able to pull those out quickly so you can make a bunch of copies of them. Um, if you have box labels, you're going to be labeling your wet boxes that you've put stuff in. You want to make sure that you have those really quickly available so you can make copies and, and stick them on the boxes during the disaster. You don't want to be going through the G drive on the server, right, to try to find those in a disaster. Having those com compiled in an area where they're easily accessible is really important. And then lists, as I said, um, really helpful to have in the back for updating purposes. Um, if you work at a big institution, you might also put together a distribution list of who gets the plan. That's something that is up there as well. Um, you also want to build up a vendor list. That's another really important one to include, you know, things like archival suppliers. And if you have account information there, uh, a generator rental might be important. Um, you know, if, uh, a boarding up service if you have a lot of windows that make it broken, roofers, locksmiths, all of those kind of names, um, they do change. So it's important to have them in the back. Um, and here's where I have my D plan uh, shout out here. I heard an expression recently, disaster planning is nothing but a lot of R&D ripping off and duplicating. So, you know, I, I agree to that, I agree with that to a certain extent. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of resources online that will help you out. You can find templates online. Uh, the Cali California Preservation Program has a great library kind of sample template, which is really good to use. There's the online tool like NEDCC's D plan, which was mentioned in the chat box there a minute ago. Um, there's more information in places like the Getty has, you know, really in depth if you want to learn more about kind of the theory behind it all. So, so use these tools. I would say the most important thing though is to customize. Um, you can't just take one of these templates or take someone else's plan and use it exactly. You're going to need to make sure that you are applying your specific institutional needs and customized to your needs. Um, I was once working with a site and I looked over their disaster plan. They had these really great um, instructions about how if the elevators go out, they were going to be hands carrying artifacts down the stairs and, and all this sort of information on that. 
took up a couple of pages. I got to the site and it was one floor. There was no elevator. So they had kind of wasted a lot of precious time in their um, emergency plan by detailing that out when it wasn't even uh, necessary at all. So you don't have to start from scratch. You can use templates, but just make sure that you are actually customizing it. Um, at the bottom one, the pocket response plan is a really great tool um, to have that sort of one of those quick, uh, quick charts. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that as well. It's a really great way to start emergency planning if you aren't sure how to start. Um, there's actually free downloadable templates online um, so that you can, uh, you can download those and kind of figure out uh, what one might work for you. On the Council of State Archivists, they have a couple of different types of uh, plans that you can download, one that's more sort of museum specific, one that's more sort of library specific. So definitely check out that website. Um, but these templates are really great because I know writing a plan kind of seems like a daunting task to a lot of people. And this is just a great way to kind of break things up into bite-sized chunks that we talked about before to really make it feel a lot less intimidating. Um, the pocket response plan is, is really great because it's easy to adapt, can kind of keep that most critical information. You can get that online template, as I said before, and then modify. Um, it's really great. It's sort of the first 24 hours. What do you do? It's all in my pocket. Um, but it is meant to complement a plan. It is not meant to replace a plan. So I do want to stress that as well. It's really good to kind of start the process, but it shouldn't be the end of the process. Um, just to show you, they kind of fold up and then they fit almost anywhere. Uh, the, the Council of State Archivist website also have these really nifty little Tyvek envelopes you can buy to, to put them in that are a little bit waterproof. Um, and then you can do stuff like stick it in your ID badge holder. This woman has highlighted kind of the things, her things that she knows she needs to do um, when her, when, if she's in an emergency situation and is not sure what to do. So, so you might do something like that as well. Um, or you could maybe post it near, near uh, phones and things like that. Um, I do want to go over what's covered in the pocket response plan just, just real quick um, to give you an idea of, of what that's about. On side A, it sort of deals with uh, communications, one side of it does. Um, so it's really helpful because it lists out a, a bunch of different types of people that you might want to have on your institutional context list. So it's really a great way to help you start brainstorming. Again, it's adaptable, so you don't have to use all those. You can delete them, the ones that don't make sense to you or don't apply, and you can add ones that do. But like I said, it's just a good way to, to have yourself start brainstorming. You can also combine people on there. For example, if your facilities person and your security person are the same person, no need to enter them twice, right? Um, you also wanna have kind of multiple modes of contact um, for your reaching key people. Generally, kind of the more responsibility a person has, the more important it is to contact them and the more ways to reach them you need. So um, you might have multiple ways to contact the director, for example. Um, put the most specific number you can. I, I like to avoid using letters um, or you know, just putting extensions. In a disaster, it can be kind of difficult to, to think quickly. So you just want the full number there, dial it right in. Um, and you might need something like a home email address in addition to your work email address. Um, because, you know, what if your server's in the basement and it's flooded and now your email's down, right? So um, that, that's something as well. Um, thinking as well about these institutional contacts, um, both after hours as well as during the, the business hours. Something also these pocket response plans I, I like to consider as well as making different versions for different people. Um, say you're a university museum and you have a student worker, at, you know, after hours in the front. Um, you don't necessarily want them having the director's phone number or, you know, all your building utilities contacts. So you might make several different versions of this. Um, just, just something else to kind of think about as you're going through this. Um, we have our first responders, uh, building utilities, as I said there as well. Um, so other things you want to kind of keep in mind. Um, I do have those emergency recovery services as I talked about um, a second ago. 
um, I did want to get you kind of started with some potential places to look. Um, the AIC's website has a find a conservator tool. So if you need a conservator for any one of these, you can look um, look up there. You can search by disaster recovery services or specialty or zip code. Um, so that's a good place to, to look. I would recommend doing this ahead of time. We don't want to do this during the disaster, trying to find our conservator, right? Um, but if you find somebody on that tool, make sure to, to shoot them an email, let them know you, you're going to put them on that list and make sure that's okay with them. Um, the National Heritage Responders is another group that is run through AIC as well. Um, these guys is mostly applicable in a really big disaster, but they're a national team that can deploy and respond. Um, at the Conservation Center, we do offer a lot of, lot of assistance. We have an emergency line as well that um, goes to after hours if you kind of need help talking through something. Uh, it's a little difficult out there in Intermountain West because we can't be there so quickly, but we, we have a lot of contacts and can help you to get in touch with people who might be more um, applicable. Um, Belfour is another great recovery vendor who has things like uh, big freezers, um, other topics like, like that. Um, and they are kind of national, so that would be another good one. And MLab is um, if you have any sort of like testing, mold testing that you might need to do. It's a, it's a big national company that works a lot with cultural institutions and is familiar to sort of the, the issues that uh, you might be facing in those cultural institutions. So those are just some, some things to kind of think about, but you might have some more sort of specific uh, vendors that you might want to think about as well. Moving back to that slide, um, other things to think about are regional contacts that might be like the State Museum Council. If you're in Utah, the Utah Division of Arts and Museums or Utah Humanities will likely have um, some local first responding um, services that, that might be able to help out with. And then that staff phone tree, which again, might need to customize based on your institution side. All right, um, on the other side, the, the back side of it is the actions. Um, so this, the template that you'll, you can download online is give you kind of a basic checklist for each of these categories, immediate response, assessment, collection, salvage, some things to sort of think of there. But again, you should definitely kind of take this, take that and use it as a tool to help you think about what are your, your immediate first steps. Um, personally, I like to add that a water response checklist since, like I said before, a lot of disasters turn out to be water disasters. So um, I like to just add a, a little section all by itself about what do I do when there's water. Um, so like I said, there's that kind of immediate response, uh, how you're going to, who you're going to call right away, um, those sort of things. Uh, what you need to do immediately in every sort of uh, disaster. And then you might, like I was mentioning for the kind of water disaster or something more specific that you've identified is really likely to happen through your risk assessment, have some more specific things to kind of walk yourself through. Um, I have the communication section on there as well, which is really important. Um, communicating is key in a disaster, especially with the media. You can't ignore the, ignore the media. If you're having a big disaster, they're going to be there. Um, so unless you want them seeking a story from just anyone on the scene, um, you'll want to take control and accommodate them. You might have kind of your go-to phrase on there, which shouldn't be no comment, right? But, you know, we were advised there was a disaster. We activated the disaster plan. Um, we will update you at X amount of time. So having that kind of written out so people just know what to say right away is a good, good thing to do. Um, the In the general prep, they do have FEMA information. I do just want to that's a section you might want to consider removing because in a, you're not going to be calling FEMA if it's, it's a disaster. Um, you might want to, what you might want to include there instead might be your local first responders, your county emergency management agency or city emergency management agency. They are a little bit more likely to actually be able to help out or provide resources than FEMA. Um, but the, the template does have FEMA written on there. Um, and then, of course, those collection priorities. What are the top 10 things in the institution? Just so you can make sure that, that you know you are, are getting there. So I did want to kind of move on to a kind of a hot topic here. I know people have a lot of questions about, is there something, how can we fund a project like this? 
Um, so here, here we'll talk a little bit about money. Um, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there's not a lot of great funding sources out there for disaster preparedness programs. We have been moving a little bit more in that direction um, with some more mitigation programs. I do have listed FEMA's disaster mitigation program. And I think in the future we might have things going that way a little bit. But right now, it's, there's a lot of response and recovery money, but not a lot of mitigation money. Um, and I know that this is a very, very important topic for a lot of small institutions, smaller institutions. So I do want to, you know, think about some creative solutions of how we can sort of fund things. Um, but I do think it is important to kind of face the reality that a lot of these initiatives are generally very difficult to get funding for. Getting a risk assessment and um, creating an emergency plan can can be a tough hurdle. Um, so it is possible, as I was saying before, to get some disaster recovery funding, especially from the state um, or country if you have a you know, big enough disaster. That's one where FEMA will get involved if an official disaster declaration is made. Um, so even if you aren't able, you, know, you don't know right off the bat, uh, something else I recommend doing is documenting how much you're spending in, on disaster recovery, no matter how little it is, because you never know if that um, disaster declaration is made, you might be able to get reimbursed for that later. So keep track. Um, this is another good thing. You might want to check in with your emergency management agencies, your, your local ones, to see if there are certain documenting procedures in your county to help out with official disaster declaration. Usually, um, there's a monetary threshold to that. You have to get over th so much money before that official disaster declaration can be made. So you might be able to help meet that threshold by documenting um, your disaster so that the whole county can go and get that declaration and then in turn get reimbursed. So everywhere is a little bit different with that. So definitely go talk to your emergency management agencies to see if you can get involved in that in some way. But if you're looking for recovery money, that's a good way to do it. Um, as I said before, there is a hazard mitigation grant program done through FEMA that potentially cultural institutions could apply for. I have not actually seen an individual institution receive one of these grants before, but definitely worth investigating. Um, I also have listed up there the Conservation Center's RISC program. That is a subsidized program by the NEH. Um, you will usually, you'll get an assessor from CCAHA to come out and conduct a risk assessment and then help you write the plan. Um, we usually, usually are able to conduct a, a number of those a year. There's a open period for applications, which won't be open again um, until 2021, but keep it in mind for future planning. Um, and there might be other local um, organizations that might have similar risk assessment programs out there. So definitely take a look at them. Um, the two top ones I want to talk in a little more detail is I think they're a little bit more kind of realistic. I want to talk about working collaboratively in a regional alliance for response to help share costs, and then also NEH's preservation assistance grant program. So Alliance for Response, or AFR, um, began in 2003 as a project from Heritage Preservation. Uh, it's now been taken over by AIC, so it lives there now. But the original initiative intended to launch a series of one-day forums designed to link key cultural heritage and emergency response representatives, leading to new partnerships, local projects, and hopefully saving money all around, right? Um, the aim of AFR was, and still is, to foster communication um, and cooperation among cultural institutions, um, influence, influence local planning efforts, and enhance protection. So. This might not seem kind of super apparent what I'm getting at here, but through an in initiative such as this, resources, including money, supplies, other things like that, manpower, can be shared. So it's a good thing to think about. Um, I've listed some of the kind of bigger networks out there. Um, so they can be leveraged to kind of help all institutions involved in our sort of inner mountain west area. We see we have a we have one in Colorado and one in Utah, which is awesome, but we do still have some blanks on the map. Um, some ideas of what some of these projects are, are listed up there. They're, the, why they're so great is because they can really help out with kind of sharing costs, right? You might not have enough money to bring in the um, 
you know, a trainer to, to train on something like an um, incident command system or something like that. But like the Galveston Houston folks have done, you might be able to go in together to get a trainer to come do a training for your whole institution. So that's definitely something you might want to think about. Um, Pittsburgh and actually a lot of our AFRs out here in Pennsylvania have a shared disaster supply cache. So all the blotter paper, all of that is, is kind of kept in one spot and um, they can kind of share those supplies that they need to so they don't have to worry about running out and buying it they can reimburse it later that kind of thing um the colorado one has a, has a good um wildfire notification system that's happening that has been really great they're working with oem the office of emergency management to kind of alert cultural institutions that might be in the path of wildfires um so there are a few as i said networks near you um, the Utah and Colorado ones are good places to start, but if you are interested in starting your own AFR, you can definitely find more um, resources on how to do that online on the AFR website, um, or, you know, let me know, and I, I definitely have helped a couple of different places with this um, recently as, as well. So this is something I'm really interested in is networking for more effective disaster response. Um, the next topic that I wanted to hit on is the NEH Preservation Assistance Grants. And these are one of the few funding sources that will actually, you know, give you cold hard cash, right? Um, which is important, right? Um, we, you know, you might want to, to think about how you can, can use money such as this. The Preservation Assistance Grant is meant to help small and mid-sized institutions. And that's uh, libraries, museums, historical societies, any cultural organization. Um, to improve their ability to preserve and care for their significant humanities collections. So improving disaster preparedness great, greatly improves your ability to preserve and care for your collection. So this can definitely be used to fund a disaster planning activity. Um, it's important uh, that you uh, kind of think about how you're going to use this kind of funding and what the best way to, to use it is. There's, there's many ways in which you can do it. Um, I kind of have listed two of the ways I think that are, are particularly helpful. You can hire an outside consultant who might come in and help with that risk assessment phase or actually help you write the grant um, or write the um, emergency plan, excuse me. It's a really great way to do it if, if you have, um, you know, if that's something that's kind of holding you back or you might use it to purchase supplies or, you know, do some of those mitigation things that you have suggested um, in your in your um, risk assessment. I did want to show some disaster supplies. Um, putting together disaster supply kits I think is a really common use of these preservation assistance grant. So I'll use that as a nice segue to talk a little bit about supplies. Um, part of your supplies will include, you know, templates about inventory control, object documentation, assessment forms, which we sort of already talked about, but other supplies that you'll need in terms of salvage um, are other things you might want to have um, on, on hand, which I've listed up here on the screen. Until you have a disaster, it can be kind of hard to estimate the types of supplies you might need and how much to have in stock. Um, on the CCHA website, we do have a list of recommended supplies that could go in your kit. So that might be a good place to start brainstorming what you might need. And how much you should have is, is a bit of a tricky question. Um, Generally, you want to shoot to have enough supplies to last the first 24 hours of a large disaster until more supplies can be shipped or um, ordered. So you want to kind of make sure that you can uh, get yourself through that or take care of yourself entirely for a small disaster. It's best to have designated supplies, um, but some things that are not designated in non-disaster times, like a wet dry vac, you, you'll want to just know where those are. Um, some things you might have to have a vendor under contract, like a generator, for example. Um, there are ready-made disaster supply kits, such as this React pack, as I have listed here. And those are really great for smaller institutions or if you just need something to kind of get started. They include the basics. Um, but you'll definitely have to supplement them with kind of blotter paper, newsprint, things that are more specific to our cultural heritage needs. Um, but if you do have the ability, it might be easier to just kind of make your own kits. And I have some really good um, pictures of some nice kits that were made at the University of California, San Diego. Um, the one on the left was put together 
for the museum for about a hundred bucks and it's on wheels so you can bring it to the disaster it's really great um, and then the other one the one on the right was museum built and stocked by an NEH preservation assistance grant actually um, it's a really good use of the grant because you can you know make multiple uh, carts with them. These kits are really great for reliable source of immediate response supplies, but it's really important that everyone at the institution understands that the supplies are to be used only in a disaster. And this can be tricky since people think, oh, I'll just borrow this one thing and return it right away. And then that's the end of that one thing. You never get it back, right? Um, at a museum I worked for once, they kind of zip tied the kit shut, which I didn't love because then you had to go get uh, you know, scissors or something somewhere. Um, it did help mitigate that sort of quote borrowing of supplies, but it, it did have its drawbacks. I had a participant at a workshop um, suggest wrapping the kits in saran wrap so you could break through it without scissors in emergency, but it would kind of discourage people from borrowing. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Um, it's really important that your kits are inventoried at least once a year and supplies are restocked um, to make sure that you are up to date on everything in your kits. So that was kind of a quick um, once over on supplies, but I did want to open it up. We do have a little bit of time here for questions. If you have questions about disaster planning, please let me know. And like I said, if you really liked this topic, we will be um, doing an in-depth um, risk assessment uh, workshop in Cortez, Colorado, and St. George, uh, Utah, just in a, just next month. So we will be able to get into these kind of more in depth then. So I'll I'll leave it for a minute to see if anybody has any questions, and then otherwise I'll let you guys go for for the day. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions up in the in the box there, so we can um, go ahead and close out. Oh, there we have one for Chloe. How often do you need to update the plan? I do recommend doing an, doing, um, an annual review of the plan, Chloe, so it might not need to be updated, but it's a good time to, to look through it. That contact section, like the phone section, that probably does need to be updated annually because I know things change often. So I like to set a date. I was mentioning that May Day date as a good one to remember to kind of check your plan. If you've been somewhere where you have had a disaster, um, so I lived in Los Angeles for a long time and we used the Northridge earthquake um, date to um, kind of be our reminder. We remembered there was an earthquake and what we did and we used that date as our uh, training date so it wasn't a good one to remember there but annually take a look at it you might not need to update every year um, but you can uh, take a look and see if you need to all right well thank you again everybody it's been great spending the afternoon with you Hoping to see some of you in person next month. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm sure I will see you around. Goodbye, everyone.